Hello there, my name is Marco Pozzetta and uh, this is the first part of uh, my talk in the first GAP, first season of uh, GAP in the context of the session Higher Order Variational Problems in Geometry. So the title is uh, On the Convergence of Geometric Flows and um, I want to start by uh, describing a little bit the plan of the whole uh, of the whole talk, which is going to be divided into three parts, and this is the global outline. So in, in, in this part, in the first one, we are um, going to uh, discuss gradient flows in Hilbert spaces and this functional tool that is called the loyasiewicz simon gradient inequality. So um, I'm, I'm going to describe the outline of the first part more in detail in a minute, but this part will be devoted essentially to, to the functional analysis that we will need later on to solve um, problems in geometric analysis uh, um, that will be of our interest in, in this part. And um, then the second and third part will be devoted more uh, on uh, problems in geometric analysis. In the second part we will discuss uh, a little bit uh, uh, geometric flows of some special kind. We will uh, focus on extrinsic geometric flow with certain properties and we will discuss their convergence taking into account the, um, the object uh, described in this part. And um, later on in the final part uh, we will focus on the um, uh, real proof of how to prove the convergence of a geometric flow, uh, whatever it means, we will see the definitions later on. And in order to do so we will, ex we will see, uh, we will focus on a specific case that will be the one of the elastic flow of curves in Rn. Again, whatever it is, it will be defined, I guess, in the second part. Um, okay, uh, that's it. Uh, I guess we can start with uh, part one. And the outline of this part is the following. As I said before, um, there will be uh, little geometry in this part. It will be more functional analysis. And uh, we will discuss uh, uh, some topics, some something in the context of smooth geometric flows in Hilbert spaces. And specifically, we will speak about convergence and subconvergence of these flows. And then we will present this tool, as I said before, that is called the Loyasiewicz time and gradient inequality. We will see how to apply it to get convergence of these flows and some uh, other comments and details about this. So um, the fact is that I, I believe that um, in order to understand what is coming next, um, the, it, it, is, it is very good, it is better to understand what happens uh, in, in this linear and apparently simpler uh, framework of uh, Hilbert spaces, of linear spaces. And then we will uh, pass to the geometry, which is eventually non-linear and, and more, more complicated. But uh, uh, the very basic and important ideas, uh, I believe, are contained in, uh, in already in this part discussed in, in linear spaces. And uh, just to give you a couple of main references for this part, uh, um, as I will describe later, uh, uh, you can find a lot of um, details and information in this beautiful paper by Ralph Chill of 2003, uh, which is uh, uh, today uh, a constant reference for the loyasiewicz simon gradient inequality, which is pure functional analysis. And uh, if, you, if you want, uh, yeah, concerning uh, results of mine and collaborators uh, that we will discuss uh, probably m more in detail in the next part, uh, however, uh, you can uh, look for this paper in collaboration with Carlo Mantegazza, who is uh, a professor here in, in Naples, uh, here in Naples. Um, okay, so um, let's jump to the mathematics. So uh, we're going to consider uh, a, a linear space, a linear structure. So um, in the following, V will always be a Hilbert space and we are going to consider, why not, a smooth function E. E has to be considered some energy that is defined on V. What do I mean by smooth? Uh, that you don't have to care too much, essentially. And the fact is just that, uh, okay, we can take uh, fresh derivatives of E 
as uh, as you like so we, we we don't really care about the the regularity at, at the moment so we have an energy defined on a hilbert space uh, a couple of very basic definitions. Uh, let's uh, recall what the first variation. First variation is sort of a derivative, the first derivative in some sense of E, and uh, it can be computed in this way, taking the derivative of E evaluated at x0 plus epsilon v, uh, derivative with respect to epsilon evaluated at 0, and we are going to adopt this symbol, which uh, simply denotes the first variation evaluated at at x0 applied to v. Indeed, if you do this computation, of course, you, you compute the, the, the Gateau derivative, if you want, of, uh, of v, and eventually it is a continuous linear functional, if, depending on the point x0 where you are uh, where you are computing the, 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 the computation, and eventually it is a linear continuous functional applied to another vector v of the space. And so, since we are in a Hilbert setting, we can use the Ries representation theorem to say that there is some gradient, which is now an element of v, that represents uh, your linear functional, and it takes this symbol nabla i at x0. And this is the scalar product of the, of the space. So this is the first variation, and once we have the first variation, we can define the relative gradient flow, which I already um, uh, want to underline, depends, of course, on the scalar product we, we, we chose. Uh, what's a gradient flow? It is just a curve, uh, x depending on t, from 0t in the space v, such that the derivative with respect to time, the, the derivative of, of this curve, is just minus the gradient evaluated along the curve. So, um, if you think of it in finite dimension, you're just uh, uh, prescribing that your trajectory moves uh, with a velocity which follows the um, most uh, decreasing way uh, for, for the energy, right? Uh, and um, indeed, uh, we always have to keep in mind uh, this remark, uh, the fact that the energy is decreasing along the flow, and it is decreasing according to a specific law, right? Because the derivative of the energy evaluated along this curve is minus norm squared of this uh, gradient t at x of t, right? So this is a gradient flow, so we are dissipating our energy E by some evolution equation, and we have this curve inside the Hilbert space. And now we can give the definition of a loyasiewicz simon inequality. We are going to, to write it down like LS inequality. So what's, what's uh, this, um, this inequality? This is the very, the very core of, of this part. Let's say that x0 is a critical point. What it means? It means that the gradient at x0 is 0. We say that E satisfies the Lyasiewicz inequality at x0 if the following happen. There are constants C sigma theta between 0 and 1, strictly greater than 0, observe, such that essentially for points sufficiently close to x0, the difference in energy between some point x and your critical point is bounded from above by a constant, constant times the norm of the gradient of E at such point x. So we really have to keep in mind this inequality, and uh, I want already to observe uh, why it is strong, it is important. Well, First of all, it is a sort of um, improved mean value theorem, right? It is Im an improved mean value theorem at least in two ways. First of all, because on the right hand side we have the gradient of E evaluated exactly at x, which is the same point we have on the left, not, not at some point uh, in between the segment connecting x with x0, right? So specifically here at x. And uh, more importantly, on the left, we have this power 1 minus theta, uh, and uh, the difference in energy is raised to, to such power. And observe that this power is, um, is, uh, is actually different from 0 and 1, right? 1 minus theta is in between 0 and 1. And so if, if we think that sigma is small, so the difference in energy is a small number, well, then raising it to a power uh, that is contained between 0 and 1 is actually much stronger than raising it to the power 1, right? Because the base here is, uh, is small. It's, we can think that the difference in energy is less than 1, right? So um, we, we, we see that uh, 
th there is already something strong behind this inequality. So um, in general, if I give you an energy, you don't know whether that energy satisfies this inequality in a neighborhood of a critical point, and uh, in general, uh, it won't. Uh, but um, what we want to say now that is that if you have a Loyasevich inequality, then you can draw uh, important and strong conclusions on uh, on the behavior of a gradient flow for such energy. For such energy. Okay, so keep in mind this inequality. And uh, now we um, go to uh, this definition about the long time behavior of uh, a gradient flow. Because, uh, yeah, eventually uh, we will be interested in convergence, and by convergence we mean, okay, what happens for long time to, to a flow. And again, in the very same setting as before, let's say that you know that your gradient flow is defined for any time, for any time, then let's say that at least maybe uh, two things may happen. The flow may subconverge or converge. By subconvergence, we, we mean that there is some x0 such that for some sequence of times diverging to plus infinity, along that sequence of times, the trajectory x of so the sequence x at tj convergence com goes to um, x0 in the in the norm of v, right? And this is the concept of subconvergence in, in this in this context of linear spaces. Uh, instead, we say that the flow converges um, if you have existence of the full limit, right? As t goes to plus infinity to x0. Here, we can think that x0 is a, a critical point of the energy, right? And uh, you see that, uh, of course, convergence is much stronger than uh, subconvergence indeed. For example, think of the fact that uh, if your flow subconverges, it may it may quite happen that along different sequences of times, you go to different uh, critical points, right? So you don't have a, a, a good stability of your trajectory. Instead, in the second case, we are saying that the full limit existence it is x0. Yeah, and um, eventually our point will be to uh, see that if my flow subconverges to some x0 and there holds a Loyasevich inequality around such x0, then the flow converges. This is a very classical, uh, classical fact, uh, already observed uh, by Loyasevich and many other people that I will mention later. And uh, I want to show you now the details of this fact because it is actually the um, also for the geometric part that we will that will come. It is actually the the the, the core of the of the subject in, in my opinion. So uh, let's move on to the details of how to prove convergence out of subconvergence plus the validity of Aloyasiewicz inequality. Uh, by the way, yes, you will forgive me for my pronunciation of Aloyasiewicz, which. For sure, it's not correct, but yeah, I'm sorry for that. Uh, let's say that we have subconvergence, so some sequence of times and a critical point at x0. Along that sequence, you go to x0, and you know that there is a Loyasiewicz Simon inequality at x0. So remember around x0 what happens. And the, the trick is to define this function h of t. h of t is the difference in energy with the critical point. Uh, with respect to the gradient flow, x of t, raised to the power theta. Theta is the, the same theta of the Loyasiewicz inequality. And uh, without loss of generality, we can assume that h of t is strictly positive, uh, because if you think about it, uh, if at some time uh, h equals zero, since h is decreasing, uh, well, then it means that you are still and then you are already at a critical point. Okay, so it's just a stupid technical fact. Let's say that h is strictly positive. And uh, remember that since e is decreasing, also h is decreasing, and it, it is going to zero as t goes to plus infinity because along a sequence of times, h goes to zero. And so what do we do? We differentiate h. And precisely, we do this for times such that x of t, my trajectory, is uh, sufficiently close to x0, uh, close in a ball of radius sigma, where sigma is the same sigma of the Loyasiewicz inequality. And we know that for some times, x of t is indeed in such ball, right? Because uh, along a sequence of times, x of tj goes arbitrarily close to 
x0, right? So at some times, x of t will be in this ball and we compute the derivative of h. Now, since h is uh, decreasing, we put a minus in front, we use the chain rule uh, and eventually the, we, we find this, this expression, right? Uh, the derivative of the energy eventually is going to be, by definition of the first variation, the gradient of v at xt times the time derivative of xt. And remember that these two vectors are equal and opposite, right? Because x of t is a gradient flow for the function uh, e. So uh, eventually this uh, product is minus the norm of one of the two vectors squared, which we can write in this way, maintaining them separated. And why do I do this? Because now I want to see exactly the norm of gradient E of xt to the power one. And I want to apply the Loyasiewicz inequality to this term. And I can do this because I am assuming that I am at some times such that x of t is sufficiently close to x0, where I can apply the Loyasiewicz inequality. So remember, uh, the inequality gives me a bound from below on gradient of e at xt. So I get greater or equal than constant times the difference in energy to that one minus theta, remember? And then again, the norm of the derivative in time. And now if you go back here, the definition of h, you actually see that a little miracle occurs, that is the fact that uh, this h to theta minus 1 over theta exactly cancel with this difference in energy. They cancel out. And so eventually we find that the last term is equal to some constant, little c, times the norm of the time derivative of the trajectory. Beautiful. And this is very cool because, so uh, what we found, we found that the norm of the velocity, right, of the gradient flow is bounded from above by minus c time derivative of h. And we can say this at any time such that xt is in the ball. And now we're going to see that uh, this is sufficient to, to get convergence because uh, now we know that by subconvergence, there is some uh, sufficiently large time, t capital J, such that uh, at that time the trajectory is inside the uh, sufficiently small ball around x0. And since h is going to 0 as time increases, also h is small as we like. For example, if you want to be precise, less than sigma over 4c, where c is the same constant here. And uh, I said this is sufficient because now we do the following. We consider any two times t2 greater than t1 greater or equal than this t capital J such that x of t is still inside the ball. It, it, it was in a smaller ball before at the time tj, so trajectory is continuous. For some times it will be still in this ball. And um, okay, such that so uh, for, for any times between uh, t capital J and t2, the trajectory is still in the ball. So we can apply the, um, the information we got before and we get the, diff the norm of the difference xt2 minus xt1. This is the norm of the integral of the time derivative. This is less than or equal by, this is a usual estimate. Uh, if you want to be precise, uh, uh, you can go back to the theory of the Bochner integral to see that the norm of the integral is less than or equal than the integral of the norm. Okay, so we get the integral of the norm, but now the norm, we, we, we know it is bounded by the derivative of h. And so the integral of the derivative gives us c times h at time 1 minus h at time 2. And this is positive, so with the minus in front is negative, it is decreasing, this is less than or equal than c, h t j, which by assumption, eventually we get it strictly less than sigma over 4, right? But this, uh, this tells us that actually our trajectory can't escape from the ball, right? Because for the triangle inequality, if you take, for example, t1 equal to t capital J, uh, you see that x at time t2 cannot be uh, out of the ball b sigma over 2 centered at, at x0, right? For the triangle inequality. So by an easy contradiction argument, uh, eventually you see that uh, xt can't leave the ball of radius sigma. So xt eventually is inside the ball b sigma at x0 for every time greater or equal than t capital J. And uh, so actually uh, my previous inequality eventually holds for any time 
t greater or equal than t capital J, not, not just for some times. And um, eventually, if you go back to this computation, knowing that you can do it now for any time greater or equal than t capital J, since h is going to zero, you see that this kind of inequality is telling you that the trajectory x as a function of time is, a co is Cauchy in V, right? So for any epsilon, you find two times sufficiently large such that this difference in norm is less than your epsilon. But now, if you know that xt is Cauchy in V by completeness, you get that there exists the limit, as t, uh, the full limit as t goes to plus infinity of xt, and eventually it is even, uh, uh, it coincides with, uh, with x0 by, by sub, because you, you already knew about subconvergence. Um, yeah, so uh, it, it is actually, eventually it is uh, surprising to, to me how this uh, Loyasevich inequality gives you the convergence out of the subconvergence. And if you really look at the details of this, uh, of this proof, eventually you discover that the key fact is that we got the integrability of the norm of the time derivative of the gradient flow. That's, that's, that's the truth. The truth. If, if you know this, then you can do this computation and you get the Cauchy property for the trajectory. So the truth is the Loyasevich inequality gave us this integrability condition on the velocity of the flow and this integrability condition gives you the convergence. So uh, remember this because um, this, this is useful to remember, and I, I will come back on this uh, later in the end of this part. Um, so this, this is the proof. And um, uh, yeah, eventually, uh, okay, using the, more or less the same computations, not only you can conclude the convergence, but also you can derive a rate of convergence to, to the critical point. It is very classical, and uh, uh, I will be very brief. Uh, the fact is that uh, once we know what happened before, if you go back to the previous computation, for example, you find a, a differential inequality for the function h, again, using the Loyasevich inequality as before. And uh, from the last computation also, you can see that uh, you have this bound, the, the distance, eventually the distance of your trajectory from the limit critical point is bounded by a constant time h. But now, the first differential inequality gives you a, a decay rate, yeah, a decay rate for h, and then this bound gives you a, a decay rate for this distance. So depending on theta, eventually you know um, the, the, the rate uh, of decay of this difference, okay? So the, the rate uh, of, of the flow converging to your limit critical point. Um, yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's it. And um, so we have seen how the inequality plus some convergence uh, plus some convergence give you convergence. Uh, but now the question is, of course, uh, yeah, okay, but uh, who can give you the Loyasevich inequality? Uh, how do you prove a Loyasevich inequality? Because you need it if you want to apply this uh, this strategy, of course. And um, so, um, in order to answer this question, let me briefly introduce a little bit of history. Uh, first of all, um, the, the Loyasevich inequality goes back to Loyasevich, of course. And we are, I, I, I'm not sure about the, the correct period, between the 60s and the 80s, uh, when Loyasevich proved that uh, that inequality uh, actually always hold for analytic functions in finite dimensions. So if E from Rn to R is analytic in a neighborhood of, okay, it's sufficient in a neighborhood of x0, if you want x0 is a critical point, not needed actually, then E satisfies a Loyasevich inequality, Loyasevich Simon inequality at x0. Um, this this is beautiful. Um, you can um, you can al already understand that uh, analyti uh, uh, some okay some rigid property on E is required in order to to derive a Loyasevich inequality. Um, I, I believe that uh, even today is not completely understood what is the optimal and minimal even in finite dimension 
a hypothesis in Prangle or Yasevich inequality. But analytic, for sure, it, uh, it's sufficient. If you just assume smoothness, then for sure it's not sufficient. And for example, uh, you, you may observe that the validity of a Yasevich inequality implies that if you have a critical point, then in the neighborhood where the um, the inequality holds, any other critical point must have the same energy of the center, right? of, of x0, of x0, right? Of, the, of that critical point. Uh, this is easy to see if you go back to, to, the, to the very inequality. And uh, so, of course, you, you may construct a smooth function, for example, in dimension 1, which violates this property. So just smoothness is not sufficient. But for sure, analytic is too much, and uh, it's it's, uh, it's it's not clear to 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 say what's what's optimal to in order to, in order to get the validity of uh, Aloyasievich inequality. So well, by the way, uh, he proved this in a um, finite dimension, and if you want to uh, look at a more recent um, proof of the finite dimensional case, you can look at this. Uh, you can look for this uh, paper by Aloyasievich and Zurro, and the fact is that. Uh, in the 80s, in 83, actually, Leon Simon uh, wrote this uh, seminal paper, which for the first time uh, extended the study and the validity of the Loyasevich inequality from finite dimension to infinite dimension. That is actually what we are interested in too, right? Uh, because previously we had a Hilbert space, but I, I, was, I was thinking of the Hilbert space as, a, as an infinite dimensional space, of course. And um, of course, the, this uh, this paper had a, a huge influence on the on the more recent uh, theory. And um, for the first time, Simon proved uh, so he proved the validity of Eliasevich inequality for certain energy on infinite dimensional spaces, and introducing a, a, a technique eventually used by many, many authors in, in the sequel that is called a dimension reduction technique. Uh, that is, under certain assumptions, uh, you realize that you get your Loyasevich inequality if and only if, okay, if you can prove it on some finite dimensional subspace or submanifold of your infinite dimensional ambient. So you realize this dimension reduction factor, so the fact that it is sufficient to prove it on some finite dimensional submanifold of your space, but then by a minor variant of this theorem here, you already know that in finite dimensions you have the inequality, and so eventually you get the validity of your inequality on the whole space. I don't want to enter in the details, I'm not an expert of these very functional analytic details uh, of how to prove a Loyasevich inequality in this generality, but you can look for the, for the paper by Simon. And um, so this is more or less the history. Um, but uh, again, how, how can we prove uh, Eloyasievich inequality? If I give you an energy and a critical point for that, I would like to understand, okay, does it hold uh, Eloyasievich inequality? And um, in order to do this, let me recall the more precisely a couple of definitions. And uh, then we will go to a proposition giving us sufficient conditions that we can verify in order to see, okay, yeah, we have a Loyasevich inequality. And the definitions are the following. Uh, we already discussed about the first variation. So let's say that E is a, um, an energy. And uh, now, because we will need it in the sequel, let's consider V to be a Banach space. Okay, And E is defined on an open set of V. And let's say that the origin is in this uh, U. Well, then the first variation, as we said before, can be computed in this way, and it is a, a, a function from u into the dual space of v, right? Because uh, uh, at the point x, you get the linear and continuous functional delta e at x, and you apply it to a vector v of v. And the second variation is the first variation of the first variation. We uh, actually will not need the complete expression of the second variation, but rather the second variation of E centered at a point x equals zero. Mm, zero will be our critical point eventually. 
And uh, in this case, you look at it uh, as a map from V into V star, and you compute it uh, under smoothness assumptions as a second ghetto derivative. And uh, again, you get that uh, this uh, function takes V into a linear and continuous functional that you applied on W in this case, right? Uh, of course, it is symmetric by its uh, very expression, so you can also think of it as a bilinear symmetric map, but uh, we will need to look at it as a map from V into V star in, in the next proposition. So this is first and second variations, and we need also this definition. We say that a continuous linear operator T between Banach spaces, for example, is a thread volume of index i if the following happens. You have that the kernel and the co-kernel of t have finite dimensions. So the dimension of the kernel is finite, and the co-dimension of the image is finite as well. And then the index is just the difference between these two dimensional numbers. Okay? Um, th this is what uh, a thread volume operator is. And of course, uh, when I will say and I will, that uh, I have a linear operator of, uh, that is Fredholm of index zero, well, that just means that these two dimensions are equal, right? Index zero, well, then dimension of the kernel is equal to the co-dimension of the image. Good. Um, so, yeah, I guess uh, this is all for the definitions. I, I don't know who's watching, so I, I, would, I will try to recall all, all the definitions uh, needed, at least. And um, eventually, uh, as I said before, we find a beautiful proposition collecting some sufficient conditions that uh, when we are ready, we can try to verify them and then get uh, for free eloyasievich simon inequality. So um, we will not need this proposition right now. We will need it later on in the very uh, technical part when we will prove the convergence of geometric flows and we will need to derive the Loyasevich inequality first. And um, the fact is that, as you can see, eventually we, we find the Loyasevich inequality under the following hypothesis. Let's say that V is a Banach space that can be embedded in some bigger space, Z. It will be very, very important to keep distinguished two, two Banach spaces. And then let's say that we have an energy that is analytic E. Let's say that zero, the origin, is a critical point. So the first variation at zero is zero, zero is in the domain. And we have to verify essentially two properties, one on the first variation and the second one on the second variation at zero. The first one is uh, to, to require that the first variation is z star valued and analytic. Okay, what do we mean by, by this? We mean that, that we mean the following. Uh, observe that v can be embedded into z. And so by duality, z star can be embedded into v star. And as we said in the, defini in the previous definition, in general, uh, both uh, these variations are v star valued. So uh, it, it is not obvious to, to see that uh, Actually, these, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's an hypothesis to require that these functional map into a subspace of V star that is uh, the suitable continuous embedding of, of Z star, of Zeta star, right? So it's, it's an hypothesis to say that these functionals are actually Zeta star valued and, and, and not just V star valued. And moreover, we need that both the energy and the first variation are analytic, and that the second variation as a functional from V to Z star is Fredholm of index zero, so what we said before. What does it mean analytic in this case? I will not give you the definition, but essentially that, uh, okay, a, a functional from a Banach space to another is analytic if you can write it as an infinite series of multilinear, uh, suitable multilinear maps, okay? Just, just like an analytic function in finite dimension, but uh, yeah, with, uh, with, the, with the correct care of the definition. Um, so eventually we will see that, uh, okay, it appears to be very abstract, this proposition, but eventually we will see that it is use useful because this hypothesis can be checked. And uh, okay, uh, at some point we will check those for our energy E, and for free we will get our 
Uh, Loia Sievich Simon uh, inequality, you see this is the, the, the conclusion around my critical point zero, and eventually, uh, okay, this is a technical observation, it will be important to see that on the right hand side we find the norm with respect to zeta star and not with respect to v star. But I, I, I hope this will be clear when, when we will apply it. So that's the proposition. Mm, uh, it is based, this proposition, on the um, previous, previous uh, paper I mentioned by Ralph Chill. Uh, this, uh, this is a very general paper giving you uh, a list of sufficient hypotheses. It, 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 he proves more, but at least uh, in this paper you find a sufficient condition that you may check in order to derive a Loyasevich inequality. And uh, however, this uh, proposition, uh, the very statement of this proposition, you can find it in this my paper, and actually it was independently proved uh, by Fabian Rupp in this other paper, and I have to say that, uh, however, mm, these uh, sort of hypotheses well, were already more or less identified in previous papers, for example, this one by Fihan and Maridakis. And um, eventually the fact is that if you give this strong hypothesis, then these hypotheses imply the list of hypotheses in the work by Chill that give you, as a, as a thesis, the, the Loyasievich inequality. Okay? That's, uh, that's it. So, uh, eventually, we, we can find sufficient condition to prove the Loyasievich inequality, and we will apply it at some point. We are, we are more than happy. And, ah, yeah, a word about analyticity, because uh, at some point uh, it, it came out this uh, fact, this hypothesis about uh, an analyticity. And uh, I want to just um, give a comment uh, of the relation between analyticity and not, not really about the Loyasevich inequality, but rather the convergence of a, of a flow, okay? And um, I want to recall this uh, well-known example. Actually, you can find it mentioned everywhere. Uh, sorry for the bad drawing, but uh, the, the idea is, is, is the following. Um, as I said before, uh, analyticity is, if, if you look close inside, uh, if you really look deep inside the papers, uh, you understand that analyticity is not essential to get the Loyasevich inequality, to get the convergence of a flow, but if you assume it, if you have it, then many things like the inequality follows. So it is still not completely clear, it is delicate to understand what's the, the correct hypothesis to, to, to make the theory works, work. And, um, however, I want to, yeah, to mention this, uh, if you remove analyticity, then you can easily construct a, a non-converging uh, gradient flow. Uh, for example, we can do it uh, even in finite dimension. Let's say that we are in dimension 2, and this is the graph of my energy functional. Okay, I called it F here, but this should be E. E is, a, I can build my energy F to be smooth, to be C infinity. But this is the graph. It is a sort of a hill, but uh, all around this hill you find a slide, okay, which uh, uh, takes you down to the, to the level uh, zero. And so if I take my starting point, my gradient flow starting inside the slide, if you look at it from above, you will eventually, of course, see that uh, your trajectory of the gradient flow is spiraling all around, and I, I can construct the energy in order that uh, this, um, this, this trajectory goes closer and closer to a limit circle, right, in, in R2. So eventually we see that as long as analyticity is removed, we find a non-converging gradient flow because the energy is always decreasing and we are following this, uh, this uh, gradient flow, but actually the flow is sub-converging and it is sub-converging to any point of this circle, right? Because for any point of this circle, we find the sequence of times such that my trajectory passes closer and closer to that point I chose. So yeah, that's a, that's a comment. Yeah, for the rest of the talk will be comments about this, uh, this theory. And uh, however, we, we will not have this uh, 
pro problems of this kind because analyticity will always be essentially guaranteed by our choices of, um, of the energy. And um, yeah, I want to comment uh, on, on the following question because this is probably one of the most, uh, most important comments of, the, of, of this part, in, in my opinion. And it is the answer to this question. Do we need actually a Loyasevich inequality? And why do we need the Loyasevich inequality in order to get the convergence? And I want to, um, to, to, to stress now the, the relevance of the validity of the Loyasevich inequality in, in the sense that uh, what can we say if we don't have a Loyasevich inequality? Do, do we really need it? And um, the, again, the answer uh, is, is not clear, but uh, for sure, I'm, I want to give this comment saying that uh, if you don't have anything, well, then this, the sole structure of being a gradient flow, as we said in the previous drawing, can't uh, guarantee uh, you to get the convergence, okay? And uh, instead of giving you an example, I want to give you some computation um, to, to uh, confirm this, this idea. So, um, fir first observation, let's say that X of T again is a gradient flow in a Hilbert space B. And the energy, okay, X0 is my critical point, and you know, up to translation, up to subtracting a constant, why not? Let's say that the energy at x0 is 0, okay? So, uh, first comment. Let's say that we don't have a Loyasevich inequality. Do we have a spontaneous re replacement for, for this inequality? Yes and no. Because the gradient flow structure provides integrability not of the norm of the velocity of the gradient, but the square of the norm, and only this. Indeed, if you go back to the very definition of the gradient flow, we know that the minus the derivative of the energy is the square of the norm of the, of the velocity, right? By definition of gradient flow. And so if I integrate both sides, I get, since the energy is decreasing, that if, if you, I am kind of trying to do the, the same computation I did before, but without the Loyasevich inequality, I, 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 I get, since, um, on the left-hand side here, I have the derivative of the energy, which is decreasing, I get integrability of this right-hand side, that is the square of the norm. And then eventually, for any two times uh, greater as you like, you find that uh, the integral from time one to time two of this squared norm is uh, small as you want. But since here you have the square, this doesn't imply that uh, the, the Cauchy property of the curve x of t, like we got before when we, 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 we didn't have these two and we actually had that, you remember that key fact that the very integrability of the norm of the velocity gave us the, the Cauchy property for, for the curve given by the gradient flow, okay? And uh, the, the reason why this implication uh, does not hold is, is simple, right? Because uh, it's just because the, the interval t1 to plus infinity is unbounded, right? So a, an L2, the fact is that an L2 integrability doesn't give us an L1 integrability, right? On an unbounded domain. And so we, without uh, the Loyasevich inequality and just using the structure of being a gradient flow, we get the, we, we don't get the correct integrability of the norm of the velocity, right? We get L2 integrability, but we wanted L1 in order to derive the, the Cauchy property. So apparently the gradient flow structure is not enough. Without any, any other information, it's not enough. And so uh, one may ask, okay, but um, instead of using the, the gradient flow structure, maybe you can use the, um, the mean value theorem or a, a sort of empowered version of the mean value theorem. Let's say something of this form, the energy bounded from above by a constant times the norm of the gradient of E at that same point X. This is better than a mean value theorem. Remember that the energy at X zero is zero by assumption here, okay? So if you want, this is a sort of um, stronger mean value theorem or weaker Loyasevich inequality in the sense that here uh, theta is zero. Uh, here you expect uh, one minus theta in a Loyasevich inequality. 
and uh, I, want, I, I claim that uh, this is still too weak in order to get the convergence, uh, in order to get the key fact we saw before, that was the integrability of the norm of the velocity of the gradient flow. Uh, indeed, what happens? Take alpha between 0 and 1, whatever you want, and try to do uh, the same computation we did before. Now I call it alpha because I don't have theta, so alpha plays the role of any possible theta. And uh, I try to do, to, to do the, the, the computation. This would be my function h I used before. I apply my inequality. And eventually, what, what happens? It happens that, uh, if you remember, in the final computation, h disappeared, right? Because I had a cancellation of the correct powers of h. Instead, here, it remains my function h, right? With, that is e evaluated along the, fl the flow raised to the power alpha. And so if you just have this inequality, eventually, again, you don't get integrability of the in L1 of the norm of the velocity, because the previous differential inequality gives you the bound integral of the L1 norm less than or equal than the logarithm of my function e to power alpha. And this is not enough, right? Because uh, since this energy is going to the energy of x0, it's going to 0. Uh, this um, right-hand side is just going to plus infinity as t2 goes to plus infinity. So you don't get the integrability of this norm from t1 to plus infinity. That was the key fact we, we, we tried to, to, to see before, right? So, um, yeah, this, this is a comment on why the, the sole structure of Bing gradient flow is, is apparently is not enough. And, um, yeah, I want to conclude this part by mentioning uh, some, um, some open directions, okay? Uh, some open directions, and uh, which I, I find really, really in interesting, interesting. And, um, again, uh, my... My aim is to to provide this uh, to, to conclude this introduction to the Loyas, to Loyasevich type inequalities now, and uh, I want to mention so uh, some um, very interesting generalized frameworks and inequalities uh, which uh, deserve to to be studied for uh, for sure, and. Um, I want to start from, from this observation. I want to recall you that um, there is a much weaker way to study, uh, today well understood, but uh, it's a much weaker way to study gradient flows, for example, in Hilbert spaces, but, but not only in Hilbert spaces. And uh, the, um, the idea behind the, the definition of this weaker, uh, of this weaker notion is, is the following. Again, Let's say that V is a Hilbert space and D is a smooth function. Again, why not? And, uh, well, for any differentiable curve, not, not necessarily a gradient flow for now, um, of course, we have uh, the following chain of inequalities, right? The minus, the derivative of E along the curve by Cauchy-Schwarz, if you want, is, great, is less than or equal than the product of the norms of gradient times velocity and by the Young inequality this is bounded above by this sum, right? For sure. And it seems to be a stupid uh, observation, but then observe that in the first inequality, you have inequality, you have equality, if and only if the two vectors are parallel, right? Are one the multiple of the other. While in the second inequality, you have equality, if and only if also the, the norm of the two vectors are equal, right? So eventually you understand that globally you have, in, you have equality if and only if your differentiable curve is exactly the gradient flow of the function E, right? Because equality implies you that uh, the velocity is parallel to the gradient and has the same, uh, the same norm, okay? And so how do we, this inequality is always true, so we can say that xt is the gradient flow if and only if, gradient flow intended in, in the sense used before, if and only if this, the opposite inequality holds, this inequality 1, right? Because if you have this inequality, eventually you have equalities everywhere and 
and you have the gradient flow. And the important fact is that uh, the definition, the vectorial definition of being a gradient flow is now replaced by a scalar inequality, right? Here, here you, you, don't see, you don't see any longer vectors on the right and on the right and on the left hand sides, right? It, it became a scalar inequality. And uh, we can adopt one to be the definition of being a gradient flow. This leads to generalized definition, uh, definitions of, uh, of uh, gradient flows. And um, the fact is that uh, there is a well understood theory, uh, I guess due to Brazil Komura, for example, uh, um, of gradient flows where a gradient flow now uh, is intended uh, to be the, the to where the definition of gradient flow is intended to be the prescription of the inequality one right and the fact is that this concept of course includes the um, gradient flows we saw before but also gradient flows of possibly non-smooth energies e for example convex and lower semi-continuous on hilbert spaces but also energies suitably defined on metric spaces if you want to see an introduction to, to this, I really suggest you to have a look at this very recent book by Ambrosio Gruen and Semola, a very, very nice book. And, um, or if you want a, a more detailed introduction, you can see the more classical book by Ambrosio Gigi and Savare. Okay, so we have generalized notions of, uh, of, uh, gradient, uh, of gradient flows. So the question is, do we have generalized notion of or weak, at least weaker notions of Loisevich inequalities, which may be applied in this context? The answer is yes, and I want to, uh, concluding by, to conclude by mentioning uh, one of uh, these generalizations. It is the following. It is called the Kurdika inequality, depending on the author. Sometimes it is called Kurdika Loisevich inequality, Kurdika Loisevich Simon, or whatever you like. Um, by the way, it is the following. Uh, again, let's say that x0 is my critical point, energy 0. We say that E again satisfy a Kurdikan inequality at x0. If there is again a neighborhood, uh, so there is sigma greater than 0, and a strictly increasing absolutely continuous function g, such that g of 0 is equal to 0, and you have this inequality. So what happens in this inequality? Essentially, on the left-hand side, essentially you have the norm of the gradient of the composition, G composition with E, right? And you are prescribing this lower bound on, on such norm, okay? Um, it can also be stated in a weaker uh, way, but uh, for, I, I will just say, I will just uh, give this, uh, this formulation. And um, the, the interesting fact is that First of all, it is weaker than having a Loyasevich inequality. Because if you go back to a Loyasevich inequality, you see that it implies a Kurdika inequality by choosing G, capital G here, to be at the, the, the correct power. Okay, so G of S is going to be S to the power something depending on theta. So it is strictly weaker than uh, having a Loyasevich inequality. And uh, it can be formulated in a way uh, to make sense in the weaker frameworks mentioned uh, above. And uh, the basic reason is that uh, you can, uh, in, in the weaker frameworks I mentioned before, you can give a, a very good replacement of the notion of norm of the gradient of E. Not gradient of E, but norm of the gradient of E. And so eventually this, um, this inequality uh, has uh, beautiful uh, analogs in, uh, in the frameworks, in the weaker frameworks uh, said before. And uh, the interesting fact is that, again, the Kurdic inequality is sufficient to improve the subconvergence of, of a gradient flow to convergence, just like we saw before with the Loyasevich inequality and by adapting the very same ideas we, we um, saw the details before. So very, very powerful. And uh, I want to mention just some, okay, this is the same uh, Kurdic inequality we said before. I want to point out some references. Uh, you have to go back to this work uh, by Kurdica to see the origin, I guess, of this, uh, of this uh, inequality. And uh, it is interesting to, um, to notice, and in, uh, probably a, a reason why we didn't understood yet, uh, or, at, or at least I didn't understand yet, um, what are uh, the, the very crucial hypothesis behind uh, these inequalities, is also the fact that both this work by Kurdica and the original works by Loyasiewicz, um, they, 
they are interested in some uh, um, problems in uh, algebraic geometry eventually and uh, indeed the the proof uh, uh, their proof of the finite dimensional for example Kurdi and the Yasevich inequality, uh, the proofs rely on eventually at some point some concept at least from algebraic geometry and probably it's, uh, it's, it's not that, um, that easy to, to make the two worlds uh, communicate. But uh, by the way, I really suggest uh, also to look at these uh, two much more recent papers one by Howard Amazon and the other one by Chill and Mildner. In the first one, you can see indeed um, a very beautiful treatment of this Kurdic inequality in weaker settings of gradient flows in metric spaces. And in the last one by Chill and Mildner, you can find, uh, you can find the implication Kurdic inequalities plus subconvergence imply convergence explained. And you can see, you can check that actually the, the argument is, is not that different from the one we saw before with the Loyasiewicz inequality. Yeah, uh, I guess that is all. Uh, my, my aim was to, to present um, the main Loyasiewicz inequality, how to apply it and point out that we have some sufficient conditions we can check to imply the Loyasiewicz inequality and to point out some, uh, I hope, interesting comments. I thank you for your attention and I hope to see you the next time. Goodbye.